<laughs> that was your cue. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, again, my name is JP LeCur. Super happy to be here. I've been a long time uh, Culture Talk uh, certified partner and uh, really excited to host this conversation today, um, which we're calling Human First, Playing the Long Game in Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I've been involved in some diversity inclusion work recently, the last couple of months, and, um, and have found this to be a really interesting topic, certainly at the time that we're living in right now uh, with what we're going through in, uh, in the country. So, but uh, we're really here to hear from three uh, other certified partners uh, of Culture Talk today uh, who I want to introduce. The first is Dr. Nicole King-Smith. And Nicole, if you will wave so everybody identifies you. Uh, Nicole is the founder of NK Enterprise Consulting, which specializes in solutions around organizational culture and diversity in the workplace. She's also a generational expert, and she's worked with numerous Fortune 500 companies, educational institutions, and professional development organizations, helping them to strategize and overcome challenges related to their organizational management, um, and specifically how they apply expertise in generational diversity and cultural inclusivity. And she works on solutions related to recruiting, hiring, retaining, and promoting staff. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. Uh, our next panelist is Susan Bailey. And Susan is the well-being and culture practice leader and vice president at Marsha McLennan Agency in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, they are a national benefits consultant an insurance broker, which is part of a global organization of 70,000 employees. Uh, so this is somebody with experience in a very large organization. And there she leads a team that works with uh, the clients of the agency on designing, implementing, and evaluating health and well-being strategies. And her focus is on inspiring health improvement and change initiatives, as well as integrating benefits and human resources and culture change programs. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. I am so glad to be here with this crew. <laughs> Excellent. And last, we have Cynthia Forsman, who is one of our co-founders at Culture Talk, a human development platform that utilizes archetypes to measure organizational culture and individual personality. And Cynthia has been integrating archetypes into her work for over 20 years, working on leaders and teams on initiatives, including branding, mergers and acquisitions, culture change initiatives, and more. And she's a nationally recognized expert on the use of archetypes in organizations and trains and certifies people from around the world to employ the concepts in their own businesses and practices. So thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Absolutely, thank you for hosting this. So, all right, great. I thought um, one of the first uh, questions I thought that would be interesting to pose to each of you uh, as a way to also to allow the rest of the audience here to get to know you individually is um, if you could share each um, some kind of a foundational experience or story that's opened your eyes to the challenges of diversity and inclusion. Um, Cynthia, do we want to start with you? <laughs> well, you, we can start with me and I'll, and I'll, I gladly admit that I grew up in a very, very non-diverse setting. Um, I'm the third of 10 children, so the biggest piece of diversity was just in the family dynamic. But we are an Irish, Italian, Catholic family that grew up in a part of New Jersey where everybody else were Irish, Italian, Catholics, and I attended Catholic school and Catholic college. And for a very, um, for a lot of my foundational years, I was surrounded by people that looked like me, that thought like me, that had similar, you know, growing up experiences. There was one um, <clears throat> one time when when I was in the fourth grade, my family did a brief move to the Midwest and we found ourselves in Minnesota just for one year. And it was the first time I had actually met a Lutheran. So I, I again, was very sheltered, um, but it wasn't really until after college when I moved to the Washington DC area and suddenly I was immersed in uh, workplaces and communities where there were people from all over the world. And I can even remember like my son being in preschool in a class full of people with names, you know, children whose names I couldn't pronounce because, you know, they were foreign. So, you know, really for me, it was until I was in my 20s before I started to really recognize um, what diversity was all about. Excellent. 
Who, who would have thought Lutheran to Catholic was a big, as <laughs> yeah, somebody who didn't grow up with a lot of going to church, that's like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Nicole, how about, uh, how about you? Do you have a personal story of how you've come to this, this whole topic and experienced it yourself? Uh, yes. So for me, it's been my whole life. My mom is Caucasian. My dad is African-American. And growing up, I remember a couple of times when I actually couldn't play with certain childhood friends if their grandmother was visiting and they tried mm -hmm. to explain to me as best as they could why that could possibly be the situation. But I specifically remember in middle school um, in homeroom and the teacher said, okay, I have to take this survey. So I need you to raise your hand if you categorize as Caucasian. And then I need you to raise your hand if you categorize as African-American. And I raised my hand both times. And she mm -hmm. told me, you can't do that. You have to pick one. And I was like, well, why do I have to pick one? Like, one's my mom, one's my dad. Like, why do I have to choose? And then fast forward 30 years later, I got, I recently got married. It'll be four years this year. And I went to go fill out my marriage license. And I had to choose again. The lady was like, you have to choose between Caucasian or African-American. And I was like, are we still making me choose a box? Like there's not a box for me. Um, so for me, it's just kind of been something that I've dealt with um, throughout my whole life. Okay. Uh, great story. A, a very personal and visceral experience with it. Uh, Susan, how about you? How did you come to this uh, topic? Oh, um, I, I will say I did grow up in a diverse community. So unlike Cynthia, I wasn't as sheltered. Um, but my story is, is a little bit different in the sense of thinking about diversity from a um, socio, social determinants, a socioeconomic perspective. And, you know, the story I would share, and you can hear my dog cheering in the background, but the story I would share is um, that I was sitting with around with some HR folks, and we were talking about strategies to take care of their people. And um, one of the HR directors asked if anybody was struggling to deal with help, uh, hungry employees. And I sort of felt like, wait, what is happening? I mean, my, it was so outside my norm, you know, a manufacturer, I knew that. I, I just couldn't process quickly enough to figure out what's happening. And she went on to explain that they didn't pay a very high wage. Um, you know, just at just below a living wage, um, which uh, meant that they she knew through discussions and things with employees that people were showing up to work hungry, and um, and that that was a challenge for them. And um, that for me was the beginning of me beginning to think about diversity from an income perspective in a whole new way, um, and you know really you know, moving beyond just race and gender diversity, age diversity to a lot of other influencers that impact who we are and how we show up every day. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, even in your just three stories here, you see there's a lot of diversity and how people understand and define diversity and inclusion. I think it's important for um, everybody to have that baseline, that understanding. Um, it can be about race. It can be about religion, uh, sexual orientation or economic um, uh, diversity. Uh, Nicole, I know in your work, um, you probably talk a lot about the definition of diversity um, and certainly even working to generational aspect in there. Could you talk about what, how you define it um, in your work and, and, uh, and why is the workplace growing more, more diverse in your opinion? Absolutely. Um, well, first, we actually have the most diverse workforce than we ever had. You have four going on five generations working together, which could be anywhere between a 60 to 70 year gap in the workplace. And then you have, um, they even said that Generation Z is actually going to be the most diverse generation there is. And so you, you see all of these uh, new things happening in the workplace. And so we're all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to figure out what that means. And a lot of times when we talk about diversity, the first thing that people want to go to is race, but we have to realize it's bigger than that. It's religion, it's socioeconomic status, it's genders, it's 
generations. It's, um, you know, your veterans, it's your LBT, LGBTQ plus. It's, there's all these variables and factors that go into what actually defines uh, categories associated with diversity and more importantly, inclusion. Hmm. Interesting. S Susan, I know that um, you've said that when companies hire uh, a person, they're getting the whole person from birth through now. Um, what did you mean by that? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, I was, I recently heard that Henry Ford, um, at some point in his time, of course, I'm from the Motor City in the Detroit area, so I've got a Henry Ford reference for you, but back in the day, um, he lamented the fact that when he hired people, you know, it was basically, why would I need a, a, you know, a set of hands? Do I get a whole person with the brain attached? You know, I mean, he really, in the early days of automation, he, he wanted robots. We didn't have robots that sophisticated back then, so we could get the cars out. Um, you know, so we are obviously humans. They're all unique and individuals. And what I've spent the last few years trying to help um, those clients that we work with and others understand is when you hire someone, you hire the, the whole person from birth, you know, to the moment they walk in the door every day, you hire their families, you hire whoever they're hanging out with after work, you hire a whole person and that experience they've had until the moment they walk in absolutely plays a role in how they expect to be treated and their interaction at work and what makes them thrive or detracts from their thriving and those factors matter absolutely yeah so this whole part this notion of the whole person i think is a great segue into talking a little bit about archetypes um and the work that we have all done uh with those i see it as a great way to to, to see that whole uh the whole person right and to understand even the whole culture right if you think of the organization as a living and breathing entity um, Cynthia, could you just, for the audience, give a quick explanation sure. um, of, of what archetypes are, and then we'll talk about maybe how, how they can be used in this way. Yeah. So um, archetypes are human stories. And more, you know, more than just being stories, they're actually stories that represent our underlying beliefs, our underlying behaviors, our underlying motivations, kind of like what makes us tick. Um, kind of how do, how do we show up and what is our unique way of doing and thinking based on our whole human experience. So, you know, there are ways at work sometimes where we sort of artificially, you know, separate that whole person. Archetypes are actually a whole person way of looking at everything that's happened to us is part of our story. Um, they come to us from Carl Jung, um, who talked about archetypes as sort of timeless stories and characters that show up as personality, that show up in groups as culture. Um, but one, one important part about them is that they're non-judgmental. So there are no good archetypes, there are no good human stories and bad stories. Rather, we think about archetypes as sort of a continuum of our experience. So whatever we're really good at also comes with some of our biggest challenges. It's sort of attached. It's a, it's a both are true. Um, sometimes I think it's like driving a car and you have, you know, a gas pedal and a brake and, and sometimes life, you know, like we're almost pushing ourselves forward and holding ourselves back at the same time. Um, but the key to working with archetypes is really understand that they're shortcuts. They're shortcuts that help us understand each other and our shared human stories. So there's aspects to archetypes where we all share archetypal patterns. Um, and as we learn to read them in each other, you know, we can uncover motivation and we can also start to shift and change outcomes and action and behavior. So Susan, I'd be interested um, in, as a certified partner, familiar with archetypes, how do you think, and I want to kind of this open this up to everybody, what's the opportunity for using archetypal understanding um, in the whole conversation work around diversity and inclusion? How, how can we apply this here? I, I, you know, I, 
my initial thinking in response to that is that um, as much as archetypes help us see how we're different, they also help us see how we are similar. Um, and they have the power, I think, to bring us together. Um, and then as they help us understand, you know, if you could see here on the screen, I'm a hero, magician, every person. These are, you know, the strengths that stand out for me. These are the archetype qualities I use on a regular basis. My uh, archetypes are balanced by others on the team. And so it helps us be a better um, collaborative unit when we better understand each other. Um, and then it also helps me have a little bit more empathy when I look at, you know, uh, you know, somebody who's leading with a different archetype, uh, it can help me understand a little bit more about, you know, just where they're coming from in a faster way than digging in to understand their full personal history and, you know, the first hire piece, it gives me a little bit more perspective. I'm sure Nicole has thoughts on that and what shows up for her, but that's kind of the first reaction that I have. Yes, Susan, you're you're absolutely correct. What it does, um, when you're going in and you're having conversations, I think some of the biggest challenges right now for organizations is to what you said earlier, Susan, you hire the whole person. So you're bringing the whole person into the, the workplace every day, yet where, where do the boundaries lie? At what point do you, you know, have to say, okay, this is, this is something that we can cater to. This is something that, you know, is, is not appropriate for the professional workplace. So what, um, what the archetypes do is they provide that foundation because when you're going in and when I've done trainings and specifically talking about implicit biases and prejudice and systemic racism, when you're having those conversations, it's emotional for certain individuals. So to come in and just off back, start talking about diversity and mm -hmm. people have, you know, everyone has their own perception of what that means, what that feels, how that affects them day in and day out inside the workplace and outside of the workplace. So what this does is it gives a foundational framework to be able to go in and again, allow everyone to focus on their similarities and some of their, well, I don't like to say differences, but some of their challenges and obstacles and focus more on the inclusivity piece because it really is about the inclusion and how do we bring people together and people tend to focus on the differences and the challenges. And even when I do the generational training and I bring up the fact that, hey, there's 60, 60 year gap. Guess what? They didn't have cell phones in the workplace 60 years ago. And some of the Generation Z is like, oh, and I'm like, what's a party line? Oh, you had to wait for another house to get off the phone to use the phone. Like, just being able, the challenges, trying to get people to understand to walk in someone else's shoes. And when you start talking about diversity, that everyone can't walk in everyone else's shoes as much as we try to um, educate people on people's different perceptions. Yeah. I'd be curious, just as a generational expert, do you, do you is there such a thing as a generational archetype? Do you think the generations <laughs> themselves have archetypes? I will definitely say the generations have their own culture, but okay. just like any box, I guess you try to put like baby boomers, like baby boomers would say, yeah. well, I don't, I don't necessarily identify with that definition. So, right. but I'm sure, okay. yes, I could, agree. I could probably say yes. Yeah. And I, I would add as well, you know, archetypes, we, we think about, you know, the ability for us to be human first. Nicole and Susan talked a little bit about the opportunity for inclusivity through archetypes. And so, you know, I might look very different from somebody else. I might have a very different background than somebody else. And yet I might share some archetypal patterns with that person. So it helps, you know, eliminate some of the otherness uh, because we can share these patterns. Um, and I totally um, agree, Susan, with what you said about, 
They also, um, when we think about archetypal differences, it gives us this lens, right? We can start to see that we're seeing the world through our own subjective lens of a particular storyline that we're wired for. And as we see it subjectively, we can sort of pull it aside and say, this is just how I see it. But now there's room to say, oh, and Susan has a different perspective and Nicole has a different perspective and JP. And, and so it's, it's, it becomes sort of a both end approach. Like all of this is true, right? Okay. And, and so let's be a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more non-judgmental, a little bit more understanding about the lens that people see things through. It, it seems like the archetypes and the understanding of them, both in yourself and others, is a great way to get to mindfulness. You know, it's like sort of a root, you know, you've got to understand, see yourself and see your own storyline before you recognize, oh, that's a story that's not necessarily truth, right? I'm going to step aside and, and, and recognize that for what it is. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, Cynthia and even Teresa, if maybe if she wants to chime in on this, in, it, have, have you guys seen culture talk clients using um, the framework for diversity and inclusion and well, how would, what would that look like? Is it an organizational survey and individual surveys? Cause you, you really do have to get down to the individual. I'm just curious if, if you guys have some thoughts on that. Yeah. So I would, um, we are just beginning um, to mm -hmm. do that and, and we don't necessarily think of having all the answers. There's a lot of mm -hmm. great work happening in diversity and inclusion that is so important that's based around educating people and starting to intellectually, you know, tap into what does this mean? Um, what we see with archetypes and with culture talk, and JP mentioned uh, an individual assessment and an organizational assessment, that's part of what culture talk the system is. Um, but what we see as an opportunity is this human first dynamic. Nicole is actually working on a project right now where she's using an assessment of archetype and a conversation about our stories to set the foundation to create some psychological safety to uh, create some opportunity for people to get a little bit more whole in how they show up. Um, so I think that's the opportunity we're, we're looking at. Is this an opportunity to approach a conversation that seems stuck and to give it a new frame, a new way to look at it? Okay. So I want to kind of bring this back to the bigger topic of, of organizational culture. Um, Susan, you lead culture and well-being as a practice at Marsh, um, how does diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, fit into that? Like what role does that play within, within the culture overall? Yeah, you like, did you like how quickly I transitioned from my earphones to my phone? You can hear me now, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, when we think about all of this together, um, there's a lot of talk right now that even though we're post, you know, not post, we're still in the middle of this pandemic, but, um, you know, we've had a significant number of layoffs, there's unemployment has risen, and yet there's still a talent attraction retention challenge that's out there. Um, I think what we've learned over the last few months is organizations are beginning to realize Saying and actually showing that you care about your people as individual humans matters, you know, more than ever before. Now we're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, do you have children? Do you not have children? Do you have, you know, elders you need to care for? You know, are you in a home where you've got six children that need to go to school every day? I mean, so there's a lot of the, the it's hard to avoid the reality that we hire humans right now. Um, so that piece is important. And then the, where the culture piece is fascinating because more and more organizations, either you saw organizations who were really clear on who they were from a culture perspective, lean on that throughout the pandemic. You know, we, they knew who their, what their values were. They knew what mattered. They, that was their guide. And then I, my other observation would be that there were organizations who, you know, were in the business of hiring hands and there wasn't clarity around who we are as an organization, what our archetype is in the organization, what our culture is. And they floundered a little bit in trying to understand how to support their people because clarity of culture and intentionality around culture was absent. 
And mm. so then it left them unable to address the diversity of the individuals that they were employing. And, and there was big gaps there and it was a challenge. That's my reaction. Right. In, the, and I know in that we, space. We spoke a little bit about the idea of environment. Um, so does that, can you talk a little bit about how diversity and inclusion, uh, uh, environment is a cultural thing, right? It's like sort of the climate of what you're working in, but does it, does it have a big effect on that? Is it all about creating that environment? You know, it's funny. I, I, the analogy I use when I talk about culture, environment, thriving, you know, because in the end, what culture is really all about supporting thriving of the individuals within it. One of the examples I use is, you know, especially in the field of health and well-being, forever, you know, as long as this field has existed, the primary focus was on the individual. You know, do better, get better, here, here's all these resources, use them and be a better, healthier human. Um, and it only recently um, have organizations in the last few years and certainly in the last few months have they begun to understand the influence of the environment that surrounds me. So you know, the analogy I use is you can feed the fish all day long, but if you never clean the tank, the fish aren't going to make it. And, you know, that is that environment piece. Now we're thinking about environment differently. It's not just the workplace for some. It's the work from home and what's surrounding them there. It's, it's the environment of just the social environment, the social unrest that we're in and the impact that's having on folks. There's, that's all playing in the environment that surrounds me in a lot of ways. And gratefully, organizations are stepping up to have dialogues around diversity, to check in with their people and see how they're doing, and owning that in ways that they haven't owned before. And Nicole, it looked like you were going to say something to respond to that. Well, I just think um, there's so many layers to this topic. And when I work with organizations um, and what I've seen most recently is they're starting to look at their statistical data and no shocker, I'm a sage. So I'm all about analytic analytics. So when you start looking at the statistical data, they're starting to see the gaps, the gaps generationally, but also the gaps racially. And when it comes to okay, what is our demographic of our company looks like? What does our culture stand for? How do we define it? And I think it was already mentioned, the gaps from what we say we're doing versus what we're actually doing. And the reality is everyone's truth is not the same. My truth is not the same as someone else's truth. So a lot of times when you're going into these conversations, it's important to have, yes, the quantitative data, to understand the statistical gaps, but you have to have that qualitative conversation and you have to be able to have a safe place for the conversation so there isn't any retaliation or there isn't any, oh, well, so-and-so said this, so um, they seem a little upset. And like, you have to be able to have the conversation and a lot of organizations are approaching it differently um, some people I know are actually just bringing up topics and talking about history and what is, you know, what is the history organizations mm -hmm. fighting over certain, certain things that are going on in their, in their cities and their towns. And so it's, you can't turn it off. You can't just come to work and then it's all on the media. All this social injustice is all around us. You have protesting going on. You can't just tell people to come to work and pretend like it's not existing, it's not affecting them. So you have to be able to have a safe place for people to have the conversation and explain how all of these things are affecting them and how it also plays out in the workplace. And I think those are some of the challenges, but at the same time, organizations are recognizing we have to have both. We have to look at our data. We have to be intentional. Um, and I hear a lot of CEOs all the time say, well, I don't understand why minorities are not applying for these positions. And then I, I turn around and say, well, do you ask? Do you ask why your succession planning is not working? Do you ask what the barriers are? Do you ask what some of the gaps are? 
And they're like, well, no, I don't, I didn't, I didn't take the time to ask. I was like, well, you can't assume you have to ask. You have to ask them why. Do they not feel safe? Do they feel like if they do get a seat at the table, they're still outnumbered? So will their voice really be valued? Will it really be heard? Will change really be implemented and integrated? And will people be intentional about it? Or will it be, oh, we checked the box? Yeah. And that's really, you know, where some some of the conversations recently have been, um, you know, talked about. You know, we, we were talking too as a panel beforehand about how, you know, we've approached a lot of this diversity conversation as a math problem. And, and Nicole's sort of talking about that, like we are measuring and, and that it's important to know how are we doing in terms of numbers. But the challenge with people is that we're more like chemistry than math, right? We're complex. And every time we connect with another human being, there's all these layers, to use your word, Nicole, of, of how we're gonna interact um, in a shared setting, in a collective setting. And so I think one of the ways that, you know, what we're doing now is sort of falling short is we can't just throw math at this. It's, it's a human problem. Human beings come as, as you know, store you know in packages that have a lot of background to them and and uh how do we how do we create that safety for them to show up fully mm -hmm. do, do you think and this is sort of for all of you it, it's such a uh, uh you know emotionally charged time right now and i have a client who's begun a diversity and inclusion effort and that that group that small group has expressed some some fear of um pushing too hard right now, especially before an election when this has just been such a, a highlighted issue. Um, there's been fear about pushing too much on the whole notion of educating, doing all, doing a lot of, you know, sort of pressing your finger onto the diversity thing um, just because they don't feel they have then especially the mechanisms in place. And I'm almost wondering if that's a challenge for other companies to just go embark right now on a very complicated set of conversations about diversity and inclusion um, can it be addressed through culture? Is there a way to take the culture building effort and have that begin to move you into naturally into sort of the DNI thing, or does it need to be its own standalone? You know, I hear you, Nicole, saying there's, you got to do very, you got to be very intentional about it. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a, a way to begin to move an organization towards that through just general culture work that provides some of that understanding, provides some of that. Um, that awareness and that makes them the step into a, a more defined DNI effort easier. I don't know. Um, well, I can I can quickly speak to this. I would say diversity and inclusion is part of your culture. I mean, when you think about defining what your culture is, you have your individual culture, but then talking about workplace, you have your organizational culture and diversity and inclusion is part of your organizational culture. And so when you start looking at performance and metrics and engagement and motivation and all these factors, you have to put diversity and inclusion as a part of that. Now, some organizations that um, are very intentional about it, they have everyone in their organization understands like their culture creed, if you will, like this is this, mm -hmm. these are the five principles that make up our culture and every employee knows about it from the time that you're hired. Like it's incorporated from the recruiting process to the hiring process, to the onboarding process, to the succession planning, all the way to accountability, all the way to performance imp improvement. Like if you're lacking performance, then how does it tie into, because we talk about with managers, the implicit bias of how they even build their teams and how they're building their teams and making sure that, again, that inclusive piece is included. So the organizations that really do it well and succeed, they make it part of the process, like the whole process, and they hold people accountable and it really is those interpersonal skills and that emotional intelligence that's really important that plays a role into it because it is about how you're leaving impressions on each other. And, and when you do say something offensive, if you do have a microaggression moment, how, how are you addressing it? Are you just letting it slide under the carpet or are you trying to really have that conversation about it and say, hey, 
Right. Our organization doesn't tolerate that. We don't, you know, you may be a high performer, but we're not going to tolerate certain things in the workplace because it doesn't align with our culture. Right. I, as what Nicole's saying also um, reminds me, and I think you would agree with this, Nicole, is that, you know, individuals and organizations are intertwined, right? And we used to artificially separate the homework life um, COVID in many ways has sort of like removed the curtain. So, you know, everybody knows that what everyone's living rooms look like and their pets and their spouses and so forth. And um, we cannot, you know, like, it's like they, they operate together. Um, one of the, the reasons that uh, stories um, work so well in thinking about culture is because as human beings, we're sort of hardwired for story, right? Story, stories have our ways of us of making meaningful connections. So if we start to think about um, our organizations through archetype, which is that story lens, again, um, it helps people kind of get into the same conversation. We now have a framework that and a language that we can tap into to talk about what is tolerated, what is not tolerated, because we definitely think like that's what culture is. It's all that unspoken, it's all that yeah. unspoken content about how we relate to each other, how we get along, how we treat each other. So the last couple of minutes we have here, I'd like to ask each of you to reflect on a couple of things. Um, what is it that's changed now in the world? right, that has made this such a, such a highlighted issue, um, obviously, maybe even beyond what's in the news. And, you know, what, what, what doesn't work and what have you seen work effectively? You know, what are the things that leaders typically will, will do that don't work? And then on the flip side of that, what does work? Um, I don't know, Susan, if we want to start with you, um, if you've seen this in, in your organization or others. I, uh, yeah, we, give me the, give me the big question, right? You know, first, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or Nicole, if you want to jump you. in. <laughs> um, well, it, you know, it's, um, I just, I think the last six, seven months have sh shined a light on diversity um, in so many ways. I mean, mm. everything from just the racial and social challenges to, you know, income inequality to, you know, whatever it might be. And, and you know, like to Cynthia's point about now we're seeing into um, family rooms. I just heard a story on a call earlier today. Someone was saying she'd worked with a client for years and never knew that anything about their family. You know, and it's, so now we're getting to know people as, as humans. Um, but then I would, the other thing that I think would be the challenge we have, and then I'm going to throw this over to Nicole, mm -hmm. is that there is, a, there is such a desire from some folks to want to say, we're all human, so let's just move on. You know, we're, we're all human. Like, uh, why, do, why does anything else matter? Um, you know, and, and the reality is everything else matters in so many ways and, and in ways we've intentionally or unintentionally chosen to ignore in the sense of, you know, we go back to Henry Ford. He just wanted hands, you know, like, but in the end, Ford Motor Company now has a very strong diversity approach. Um, and so, again, I... I think that that idea for the good hearted people and whoever was out there that just said, well, we're all humans. I don't, you know, I don't see any diversity. We're just human. There's, there's more to it. And I think we can't, we can't get away with that thinking that. any yeah. longer, the simplicity of that. I don't know, Nicole, what you would answer JP's question and respond to my, uh, my thought. Um. Well, a couple of things. One thing that I think has definitely changed that we cannot ignore is technology. Um, mm -hmm. Technology has given us insight and access to things very instantly um, from videos, from, you know, just everything and all the social media platforms. Like we're getting things very, very fast. And, and with that being said, you know, we have to be aware of how that plays a role. 
depending on who you're having the conversation with, some people would say a lot of stuff that's happening today is nothing new. It's been going on for, for, for years. It's just now that we have technology it's advanced as the way we do. We're getting access to information from all angles where normally you may not have, have gotten access to information. Um, secondly, I would say what, what are the positive and the negatives? I think, I think the challenge when I do certain trainings, some organizations are like, yeah, we need to talk about diversity and inclusion. And then they make it obligated for everyone to attend diversity training. And the challenges with that is, Training doesn't fix necessarily the situation, but it does open up the opportunity to dialogue about it. And so it's, again, it's good, but you gotta understand, can you support what comes out of the training? And statistics show, like for example, um, I know Cynthia, you brought up work like recruiting. Well, just recently someone was sharing with me that his name's Jose, as soon as he changed his name to Joe, he got all these inquiries to get hired just on something that simple. And I think that's the part that a lot of people don't understand depending on how diversity and inclusion affects you as an individual, like kind of what I shared, like my parents couldn't relate to the fact that I didn't have a box to check on my marriage license, my own parents, because they're both of one race. So I think it really depends on who you're talking to and how you're talking to it. Can you be able to respect the challenges that they have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis? And when you're having those conversations, especially in the workforce, not everybody is ready to digest that because it's hard for everyone to relate to that. Something as simple as you changed your name and all of a sudden you got a whole bunch of callbacks. So, you know, the good and the bad of it, the good is people want to have the conversations and people are trying to be intentional about it, but the challenge is, are you willing and ready to accept everything that comes with it? Because it affects everyone differently on different layers, and, and that's just the truth behind it. Hmm. That's an incredible story, um, Nicole. And I think it points to the fact that we have to go deeper with this conversation. Um, I feel like every time the word diversity comes up, everybody's defenses kind of go up a little bit, right? Because we're all like, oh, how are people going to see me? Like whether I'm an offender or someone being offended, like we all, like nobody wants that microscope on, on that, right? Um, so it, it, it's tough from that standpoint. Um, what, I, what I like about... Um, archetype, bringing it back to kind of my area of expertise, like we need things to change. We need people like change is, is there's this intellectual piece of educating people that is important. We need to understand, we need to have the conversations, but there's sort of a safety net in, in like, it's a conversation out here versus it's an internal looking at who am I and, and I'm not going to change my own behavior until I start to see how I show up unconsciously, right? So we're all this, um, you know, as I said, our, our archetypal patterns provide us this idea of, of behavior that's on a continuum. So in part, like I'll look at my archetype creator as a number one archetype, the strengths of that pattern are about generating ideas, you know, making things, making beautiful, meaningful things. But the whole shadow aspect to that pattern has a different, it comes from the same motivation, but it's about perfectionism. It's about judgment of other people's creations. And so when I start to understand that my pattern has both possibilities, that's when I personally can go, oh, wow, I don't like that. You know, I, I don't want... I don't want to bring that to the party. So I, I just think that like, you know, Susan, we could talk about this from a wellness perspective. Like we all know how to lose weight. We all know how to, you know what I mean? Like the intellectual ideas about those things are out there, but we don't ever personally change until we start to become aware of what we're doing unconsciously that's sort of in competition for what we say we're all about because both are true. 
Right. So. Well, thank you all. I want to be cognizant of the time and allow a little, little uh, opportunity for Q and A. Um, thank you guys all for your thoughts on this. Obviously, um, you know, it's a big topic. It's one that's still evolving. I don't think anybody has all the right answers, right? But this is these kinds of conversations are, are I think, what helps us all to advance um, uh, the, the conversation and get a little bit better at all these things. So um, thank you guys. Uh, Teresa, do you want to open it up to Q and A? Do we have any questions? Did anybody want to? Absolutely. Wanna... Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to um, throw some questions and JP, please feel free to, um, to dive in and participate in this Q and A. And if anyone has sure. questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat or when I get through, there's a handful that are in the chat here. When I get through with those, if you want to open up your mic and just, um, you know, direct them to the panel, that would be awesome too. So um, first of all, you guys, thank you so much. There was just so much richness in the perspectives that you each shared. I'm sitting here taking notes and, and you know, taking away key points. And, you know, I, I really, um, you know, I have to say some of the, some of the real sticky ones for me were this, as this uh, idea of qualitative stories, um, Nicole, that came out of um, some of what you were sharing. I think that was a, a really cool, um, you know, really key point. And I'm sure that everybody um, as well, maybe you could start to share some of the ideas that you consider um, and when you, you know, put them in the chat as well. But um, I'd like to share Kate's question. Kate asked um, in understanding if archetypes are truly cross-cultural and truly universal, saying that Jung was a Western European, so how inclusive was his research? So I'm gonna mm. throw that out there. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, um, Teresa and I have worked with archetypes for 20 years, probably. And, and for a long time, we would, we only worked in the US and we would say, these are universal storylines that we understand across cultures. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago, we launched Culture Talk and we started getting a lot of inquiries from around the world, from all different cultures, that we started really to go, wow, they are cross-cultural from, you know, we had that experience because suddenly we were talking to people in Brazil and in India and in Sweden and the UK and France and India um, that, that could understand these storylines as well and tap into them as universal. So I hope that answers. Yeah, and I think if you look at culture and you, and you know, movies and the characters, I mean, they're universal you know, across those cultures too. So that, that's my sense is that uh, there is something truly just fundamentally human about, about you, know, you could argue whether Jung had 12 or 30 or whatever, but I do think that there's some just fundamental human commonness to it, which is part of what makes it so great. Yeah, it's kind of, it kind of becomes a shortcut, right? It's yeah. a shortcut because I can see Susan's hero and I already know what a hero does. How, how, how that hero, yeah. <laughs> we can find some common ground no matter what. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to um, move over to Philippa's question. Um, she's asking, if an organization was starting from scratch, what would the panelists recommend um, to be the first three actions that an organization might take to play in the long game. So we've positioned this as the long game. And mm -hmm. um, do you have some practical ways to consider, you know, actions that organizations can put in place? Can, can I start this and then oh, uh, Nicole and Cynthia run with it? But I, the first thing I would recommend, again, because I work with companies of all sizes, First question that needs to be answered is, does the organization actually want to be around for a long time? Beca and get the leadership to answer that question. Do you want to be in it for the long game? Is there a long game? Mm -hmm. And is there a plan for that long game? Like if, you know, you I think about, you know, smaller businesses, is there a succession plan? I mean, what? just digging in, seeking to understand, do you want to be around for a long time? Because I've come to learn in the last 10 years, there's some organizations who are all about to churn and burn, sell, get sold, you know, they really don't care. So that's, for me, that is key to understanding before we dig into, frankly, caring about culture and diversity, because unfortunately, if the organization isn't, 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 focused on the long game, then the rest is going to be really hard because other things are going to be more important. That's my perspective. Nicole, Cynthia, I don't know what else you would add to that, but step well, one. 
I, I'd love to just pivot on Susan and then pass it to you, Nicole, because I love that question. Are you in it for the long game? Um, because another category of businesses that I think we see are the people that give it sort of the, the head nod, like, yes, we care about this, but they're actually looking for a check the box. Like we had a diversity panel or we did a this and they're not looking because the long game is not about anything that that is the flavor of the month or the training program of the year when we say the long game we talk we're, we're looking at how do you create sustainable change and and influence you know our shared experience as a culture and nicole i know you've got some work you're doing now maybe you could share about yeah, um, I definitely agree with both what Susan and Cynthia said. You know, what are what is the end result that you're trying to get to? And, you know, doing an analysis of where those gaps exist. Where do you see that those gaps exist? And again, to what Cynthia said, making sure that you're not checking the box because once you start being intentional about being more inclusive in the workplace, there's things that are going to uncover in people's management styles. And like I said, organizations that do it well when it comes to performance improvement plans and working with managers, it's accountability. And not everyone likes accountability. Uh, so it depends on what level you're going to agree to even hold people accountable and um, going it from from that point but i definitely agree with what cynthia susan said as well so to recap and I have, oh go ahead jp go ahead yeah yeah and i just had one thought on that which is that um i think it's really important at the outset to um uh establish some com some commonality across the organization right a strong purpose and and you know doing having your hands around what are the archetypes that define this culture We're getting everybody on the same page with at least who we are as an organization culturally what do we stand for as our purposes it's hugely important before I think you can really dive into um, you know to the rest of that conversation because at least that provides the foundation um, that that uh, um, that everybody we're, you know we're all in this together before we start going in and, and picking apart you know the differences and, and the way uh, the people um, operate and the education that I think naturally has to have come uh, happen to, to overcome these natural biases. So awesome! I love I love how you each added one of the point the points on a plan. So hopefully this starts to answer <laughs> that really important question. So it was um, you know ask the question you know are you in this for the long game? Analyze or maybe going to JP's second um, establish what our common purpose mm -hmm. and culture are together analyze the gaps between what we say and what we actually do and show up and then hold people accountable. Um, so nice job guys on, nice uh, <laughs> on really creating a, a, a plan there. That was um, free flow too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Totally um, made that up. So we're, we're rounding up to the top of the hour. Is, does it, um, anybody want to unmute and ask a question or add a comment from their own experience, share some insight. We'd love to hear from you. I'll, I'd like to just make a quick comment. Um, I just think it was interesting. Thank you so much for opening my eyes in a different way, Nicole, about what I've seen as diversity in myself. I grew up from a small in a small town, and if you said the name of the town, people would go like, "Ew, you're from there," you know. And so, um, if you didn't live right in the town, or if you, it was all this stuff, so I just really appreciate like the different look at the ways that prejudice and diversity and all of that shows up. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Any other closing thoughts, comments? Hi, um, quick question. Um, is there any books that you guys recommend um, if you're mm -hmm. just getting started? Getting started on culture and archetypes or diversity? Can you get add a little more color to that? <laughs> uh, getting started in, in uh, diversity. Okay. Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> you are the pro. Nicole. <laughs> oh, man, I, uh, as far as books off the, 
the top of my head. Let me let me get you a list of books because I do a lot of um, like articles. Like I look at a lot of diversity institutions. So like Harvard does a lot of studies on diversity and I look at their statistical data. Um, there's also um, a kinetics institute for generations and I get a so I get a lot of stuff from more of a academic source because of the primary research that they put into that but I will definitely promise you that I will have some books to follow up but I, I use a lot of Harvard Business Review stuff just because I know how all of that was was processed okay all right, so Nicole, you'll get some things together and then maybe we can share that out um, to the group. We'll, we'll be sending out a re recording of the webinar from the point at which I remember to hit record um, early on, but after the introductions. Um, and uh, maybe we can share some of those resources um, with everyone who's interested. Um, so if there are any more questions, please let us know. I'm also just going to stick into the chat. If you are interested in learning more about archetypes and this foundation, the foundation of this um, conversation and the work um, that the group here is trained in in Culture Talk, I'm going to put a link in the chat to, um, to just set up a, a quick call if that's something that you would like to learn more about, about the program or the opportunity there. Um, so I am going to just stick that in there and also say thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate you participating um, in this. As we said, this is um, a field and a topic that is challenging, but we feel like we have um, something real of value to add to that conversation. And we know that all of you who joined us here do as well. So we really appreciate it. Um, and I'm gonna stick that in there. This is a link to set up a call if you're interested in learning more. Cool. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. <laughs> People are on. <laughs> Hi, Patricia. <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> I think you're muted. Yeah. I was oh, muted again. Oh. You're still muted. Hang on. I just recognized I had a friendly on here. <laughs> Can you unmute her? Uh, I, I keep trying. I think we're doing each other in opposites. <laughs> let, let Teresa, let Teresa unmute you. Let's see. So I think oh, there, there you are. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. Well, thank you. So I'm one of the folks that's going to be signing up for, uh, for, on your calendar because I'd like to learn more about the, the whole program and and whatnot because it's really it's really quite wonderful and um, I've worked in very large organizations and certainly um, recognize the need for understanding the the archetypes <laughs> because because I think I'm a creator it's just sort of off the top of my head just from just what you described so about right. I think it's really and, and I too, Cynthia, grew up in a very large family that, you know, you, you kind of learn that like managing through some of that stuff just by virtue of early, yeah, yeah. early organizational experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boardroom Excellent. meetings, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was good to see you. Thanks for joining. How'd you hear well, about I, it? I'm just curious. It was very well done. Very well done. So I, how, um, yeah. How did you, how did you hear about it? I don't know. I think that uh -huh. I, um, I think that I received a, an email based on maybe conscious capitalism. Was there something oh. like the conscious capitalism? No, so I, when no. I received the email, okay. well, I, I don't know. Huh. I, you know, <laughs> just, okay. but when I saw it, yeah. I in very, um, very Patricia's concerned. been to a bunch of the New York City conscious capitalism events. So. Yeah, and you know, I, I actually just wrote an article that's going to be in um, a, a, a magazine called or a website called Techonomy, which is the combination of techno technology and business. And specifically, I referred to inclusion and um, mental models, like from a systemic thinking standpoint, because so my background is in product development and design, and I've done a lot of work in digital at the intersection of technology and sort of uh, creativity. But the thing that I'm noticing now is that it, it, you really have to be thinking about how people think so the or how they act and you know, the things that they do, just because of where they're coming from, from a mental mm -hmm. model standpoint. And so like, I'm, I'm thinking of um, like the, the things that I've seen, 
really need to be addressed. And people don't have the tools for the people part of it, which is the right. most important part of it. Like I can do the stuff with the technology because there's all kinds of ways that I can manage mm -hmm. the technology, but I, I don't have the, the tools hmm. to do the, you know, the, the people part. So mm -hmm. I just felt like this is really like, oh my God, like, wow. Yeah, you, you love it. I mean, this is- as a, as a Jungian, um, she's got a background in Jungian psychology. So I kind of, right. <laughs> kind of, and I, kind of sort of drawn to it. I don't remember if you, if you were at, um, what was it one of the EO sessions where I spoke about, this was part of what I talked about and have, you know, been a long time supporter of these guys. And I just love the model. I use it all and everything. So, um, it's great. I mean, you, you, I think you'd get a lot out of it. So, and it might be, so it might be worthwhile to do a presentation for the EF as well at some point. So the executive. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I meant EF, not EO. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, no. So I presented at EF. I presented it. Oh. It was the fall of 2018 and, and architects okay. was a big part right. of that, that, that brand Got culture it. presentation. So, okay. um, yeah. but it's probably, they probably need to refer.